Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Mo Tatsik. She's a uh, the investigations editor at the American Prospect at prospect.org. Uh, Mo, uh, welcome back to the program. The FTC has filed suit along with 17, uh, I think it is, uh, states uh, against Amazon. And... Um, for basically two, it seems to me, there's there's two ac major accusations. Uh, the first is that the company is preventing sellers from offering lower prices on other retail sites um, by basically saying, we're going to shut off your ability to sell on Amazon more or less. We're going to make it very difficult. And the other is that Amazon is also uses their, uh, their heft to... Um, to prevent other people from providing fulfillment in terms of shipping. Are there, is it, do I have that right? Are there other, uh, are there other aspects to this suit? Um, I think that's a pretty good assessment. Um, one of the things that is, I think specifically um, pretty insidious about the way Amazon works is that um, if you're a, a third party seller on Amazon and 60% of the goods bought and sold on Amazon are um, sold by third party sellers, um, you have a uh, you have to give a, a larger and larger portion of your revenue to Amazon. Um, at this point, it's forty five percent or fifty percent, forty between forty five and fifty two percent um, of your gross that goes just straight to Amazon for all of their fees and, um, <laughs> and advertising and the the whole litany of fees. Um, this was set nineteen percent not too long ago. I think it was thirty percent um, during the pandemic, and thirty percent was pretty high. Um, but uh, forty five fifty percent is um, is 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 really cutting into um, a lot of uh, small businesses' ability to to you know be sustainable. And so, of course, they would love to sell um, their their goods on competing marketplaces, whether it's Walmart or eBay or, God, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was something <laughs> slightly less evil? Um, they cannot, however, try to uh, induce their customers to go somewhere else. Um, oh, also their own Shopify sites. That's a that's another thing. A lot of um, a lot of small um, businesses have their own um, Shopify sites, and that allows them to actually collect data on their um, customers, kind of figure out, um, you know, know where they live, send them um, promotions, etc. Um, they are not allowed to charge less uh, to those customers who go out of their way to uh, buy from them on um, Shopify than um, than they. They do on Amazon. Um, well, this used to be a contractual obligation of an Amazon seller. Um, in 2019, they lifted that, knowing I think that they were under investigation. Um, the Trump administration commenced its investigation into Amazon in 2019, um, and the um, and that is, by the way, it's the Trump administration who started this. Um, and so, uh, Jeff Bezos did not write nicely about right, Trump in the, in the Washington Post. We should say he has these amazing tweets where he's like, you know, the the USPS has been playing delivery boy to Amazon, and like they're getting a terrible deal. And you know, it wasn't he wasn't wrong. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, you know what? Deal. There was a a broken clock. I mean, I don't care like, what his his motivation was. No. It was helpful. I mean, it would be so great if we could just have like Trump do social media for <laughs> for Lena Khan. Um, but uh, because I think that like, you know, in theory, he he kind of likes uh, he, he wants to like a lot of what she does. But um, in any case, um, the uh, so if you're a small um, business, you'd love to kind of sell more over anybody but Amazon. Um, but you you can't induce your customers to do that by offering them lower prices. So that is what this is about. Um, it's it's really a practice on Amazon's part. Oh, and I should say what they do is they root out, uh, you know, of folks, uh, third party sellers who are charging discounts elsewhere, and then they just sort of suppress their search results. So they used to just kick you off entirely. Now they have this kind of much more insidious practice where they, um, you know, where, where they, they're constantly monitoring your, um, your prices everywhere all over the internet. And they have this kind of very um, detailed surveillance network. Um, and they, um, they just, you know, make it put your sales to zero, basically. Um, by using their algorithm, and um, this uh, this is very insidious. The by the way, the um, the delivery apps do this to restaurants as well. Um, it's a very um, common practice. But when you're dealing with um, a company like Amazon that has 
you know, 83% market share, according to the complaint in the uh, online superstore um, uh, space, um, potentially 50, 55% of all e-commerce um, in, you know, in, that's, in the country. That's amazing. I mean, that's what Bezos set out to do, right? He basically said, I want to replace everything. everything. Like I just like, I want to be like, you, you don't go, if you're looking to buy something, you don't go to Google or any other search uh, thing, you use Amazon. That becomes the sort of like intermediary to buy anything at any time. Um, and and this is one of the practices that, that makes it impossible for any other marketplaces uh, to, to get established. Exactly. And, you know, it's one of those things that this practice in particular, um, because there's so many anti-competitive things that Amazon does, so many abuses that they um, that they perpetrate on, you know, both on, on mostly their third party sellers and their workers. Um, but this is this is an area where customers and uh, and small businesses sort of suffer equally. Um, so I think that it was a really strong case for them to kind of uh, may, uh, put at the centerpiece of their um, complaint, because we all know it. We all know that the same things that we purchased on Amazon, you know, four years ago are, you know, dramatically more expensive. We all know that it's much harder to find what you're looking for and that you get sort of assaulted with ads. Um, everybody sort of who uses Amazon and, you know, I'm one of those people, like I'm, I'm a mom of two small children. I can't not use Amazon. Um, I, there's, I know a lot of good people who um, who try to stay away from it entirely, um, but it's very difficult um, uh, for you know for for some of us. And 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 I you know think that it's the, the responsibility of the government to actually start to um, legislate their practices. So um, I, I thought that it was a great um, it was a it was a really good first step. I was really mad about the redactions. Um, the, well, the okay, let's. I don't <laughs> think people know what you mean by that because. Um, I, I was sort of hinting at it when I was introducing this is that it is, and, and this has happened in the Google case too. And it's sort of fascinating because of what, what happens because of these redactions, but just explain to us what, what you mean by redactions. So the complaint um, was released last week, but about one third of it was blacked out. Um, and it's, it's blacked out in this, it's not like full pages are blacked out. It'll be like, you know, four fifths of the page and then there'll be a random sentence. And, um, so the, the act of just reading, it was like very disorienting. And, um, there was one section at the end, um, on something called project Nessie and everything besides project Nessie, those, that word, um, was, was blocked, uh, blacked out. So, um, this is, uh, something that the FTC, it's in the rules that they sort of have to give the companies under investigation, um, you know, the right to redact, um, you know, within reason, um, I guess, or the right to redact anything that was obtained in the discovery process and in, in, uh, in the investment in the by civil investigative demand. So anything internal and um, a lot of really silly things um, ended up getting redacted. Now, um, the judge, John Chun, um, it's basically his discretion on whether he's going to keep these redactions permanent or um, or unseal um, uh, parts of this lawsuit um, pretty soon. In the Google case, which is um, occurring concurrently, there's a trial underway. And the judge in that case has been extremely um, deferential to Google's um, uh, desire to, um, you know, avoid embarrassment or what they call clickbait. Um, Google actually told the judge, oh, we don't really think that you need to make public any of these exhibits because, you know, it's what's it going to do but produce clickbait? Well, clickbait is, you know, how you get the the nation, how you get um, Amazon customers, how you get, um, you know, readers and, and citizens um, engaged with you know, this story and how you kind of explain to them how these companies work. I think it's the most important thing. I've spent my life as a financial journalist and, um, you know, lawsuits, there's, there is, there's no freedom of information act for mon the monopolies that run your life. Wait, you why? No, wait, so, so yeah. where did this come from? Like, because this is, I mean, it seems to me like this is, um, if I was at the, you know, if I was at big monopoly uh, headquarters and ran their PR department, I would be like, this is, this is, this is our, this is basically how we keep, uh, you know, maintaining monopolies is by 
not allowing stories essentially to be written about what the implications of these monopolies are and what we're able to do and, and this and that like where did is this statutory is it uh is it just like the way that the antitrust laws are written up or when were when was this dynamic because this dynamic doesn't really exist in the same way if the doj was going after you know some like f criminal enterprise they couldn't uh, hide some of the they, the company would not have the ability to decide like the benefit of the doubt is with us mm. in terms of what our company secrets that we can't uh, let people know. Right. So it, the, in this case for, with the FTC, it is actually in the FTC's charter that they, uh, that uh, ac according to the, the sealing order, because it was the FTC who actually, um, uh, you know, uh, wrote the motion to seal in this case, and it's a temporary seal. Um, and and you know I, I've spoke to spoken to some attorneys there, and this is actually in the FTC rules. Um, probably has something to do with the fact that like these, it, what, this wasn't um, you know like traditional discovery that led to these um, revelations. A lot of them were, you know, they were civil investigative demands, which are some something different from subpoenas. Somehow, I'm not a lawyer, so I um, I don't really understand fully the weeds um there but um clearly a lot of it is discretionary and it is you know you make these calculations you choose your battles in the case of the um, google case obviously that is a trial um the rules uh ought to be very different in that case the judge has certainly um said things like well you know i'm going to sort of i i'm going to play it safe i'm going to be conservative this company is telling me that um you know this that that the disclosure of these things would um you know threaten to um uh expose competitive information and to, to which i say like this is a, this is a lawsuit about uh, anti-competitive activity. Like, what, what do I, you know, I don't, what do I care about your, you know, competitive secrets? Like, this is the whole point. Um, and, and, the, and the point is too, is like, who's Google's competitor? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, right? like, like the, I mean, that the, is the whole that's point. the whole point. That's why yes. we're here. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so it's a little bit different in that case. And I think that in that case, also the justice department, um, bears some of the blame because I think that they have, uh, gone easy on on Google in hopes of I don't know making the proceeding more civil. I'm not sure um, obtaining a, a a better settlement when it you know if, if and when it comes to that. I don't know, but I know that the um, the Justice Department in that case shares some of the blame. And we have to remember we have some really great trust busters um, on uh, Team Biden, but. Ultimately, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of lawyers that get involved in these things. And a lot of them um, have much more, uh, you know, conservative, uh, deferential, uh, you know, chicken chick club, you could call it, um, right. uh, you know, mentalities about what their jobs are. Um, and it's a shame. But um, what, you know, the public needs to get angry. And that's a sort of, I, you know, wrote a story entirely about the redactions in the Amazon case. I can't wait to get my hands on the, um, on the unredacted case. But um, I think we should be really angry that, you know, judges are um, allowing this. Um, this is, these are, you know, again, like I said, there's no Freedom of Information Act. This is our only chance um, to get, to, to, to really understand how business works. I have literally, uh, you know, all of my education in terms of understanding how our economy works um, has, has come through lawsuits, I would say. I mean, a, a major portion of that, um, because, you know, they, they break, the law all the time and um and nobody you know holds them accountable and we're you know in the effort to do that we we have to tell the public what they're doing um so yes uh, and, it, <laughs> yeah. and it seems like there's also sort of like we you know there has been a i think a uh, i mean i think it's inarguable there's been a definite turn in terms of like this administration and their perspective on antitrust like we are uh, th this administration and the personnel that have come in, particularly at the leadership, you know, like Khan and uh, over at Cantor, uh, uh, yeah. um, represent a a big return to uh, antitrust ideology, if you will, or perspective that existed 50 years ago pre Bork uh, when when this right. changed. But we still have, it seems to me, a system like any judge who is hearing these cases to the extent that they had any background in antitrust 
it was under a completely different sort of like regime, if you will. And all of their training and all of their success in that industry was a function of the way it was set up then. And they're still operating on that. We, we're, we're 10, 15 years off from having judges who may even reflect the current sort of uh, perspective on antitrust. Yes, we have to, we are at the mercy of judges who have been systematically brainwashed, frankly. Um, you know, the, the, the anti-antitrust movement or the Chicago School of Law and Economics, I used to call it like law and anarchy because it's really a, 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 an ideology that sort of always ends up in the position of let the market sort it out. We don't, why do we need to be involved in this? And, uh, you know, that has been a project that dates back to the 50s um, in the starting around the 70s and, and really getting, you know, strong in, in the 80s. You know, we had George Mason when we had University of Chicago and, and Stanford and, uh, you know, a, a ton of, um, of you know, pretty uh, well, uh, well uh, funded institutions holding, you know, retreats for judges, uh, ex you know, that were almost, um, you know, completely staffed by economists. Um, of course, this is something that, you know, the University of Chicago thought of, well, why don't we just get the economists to teach law school? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, that's sort of where it started. And these economists were all kind of right wing and of the mentality that antitrust is silly and it's, it's this sort of unjust intrusion in the market. And um, and so we're we're going to be dealing with the legacy of this for some time, um, because that it, they've been you know thousands of judges have gone through these programs, um, lived in this paradigm, um, you know must um, sort of uh, comply with these precedents that have been ha have been set um, by the Supreme Court and and you know um, appeals courts that really really limit what you can do um, in terms of antitrust enforcement, and that's how Lena got her start. Um, in the Amazon cases with her landmark 2017 paper, uh, Amazon's Antitrust Paradox, um, really goes into how the entire business model of Amazon and, by the way, the rest of Silicon Valley, Uber, DoorDash, you know, all the rest of, of those um, those companies, those, those money-burning companies, right? Um, this was illegal. Predatory pricing, the, um, the idea that you would um, set your prices on something so low that you would run every potential competitor out of the market that was a you know straight up you know uh, obviously central casting restraint of trade um very much um something that wasn't done um and was as you know in until the the 80s um then a series of supreme court decisions really um uh raised the threshold for proving that predatory pricing was happening to this bar that was like almost impossible to uh, to meet. So um, so Amazon sort of took advantage of that and 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 you know pounced into this market where um, you know this this new paradigm where predatory pricing law was not enforced in any meaningful way, and um, and and did exactly that. They you know they they told Wall Street, hey, we're making a monopoly. Um, you know uh, you, you better just fund us. We're we're not going to uh, turn a profit at any you know anytime soon so don't ask us to um and but we will give you growth and we will make sure that nobody else can succeed in in doing anything that we try to do and they've really been um unbelievably successful and now we're sort of paying the bill you know the bills for that everybody loves amazon because they give us something that we didn't, you know, used to be able to get, which is free delivery on everything. Um, but, you know, who's paid the price for that? You know, obviously the Postal Service has paid the price. Um, cities and towns, um, they, you know, for, for 20 years, they didn't charge sales taxes. Um, so that was like an unfair advantage. There's tons of subsidies that Amazon has gotten to, um, in addition to the subsidy of, of not having to comply with predatory pricing law. Um, over the years that, um, that, you know, are now the bills come due for that. And, and, you know, sellers are paying the price and consumers are finally paying the price. And, you know, I think that we all get that there needs to, this, this needs to be, um, this needs to be regulated. And, and I, and I want to just like, you know, uh, emphasizing, you know, when you say uh, brainwash, like the analogy to me is sort of like what we saw with doctors. I mean, surely there was some bad actors, 
uh, you know, in terms of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who would um, uh, prescribe, but like the, the uh, you know, the, the Oxycontin uh, thing, like, you know, doctors were told that this stuff was somehow non-addictive now <laughs> because of the way that, that it was constructed. And there was, a, you know, a generation of doctors who that's what they were told in the, in the context of like right. law school, if you bring in economics and you bring in an economist these would be lawyers are sitting there and and economics is treated as if it was like a a pure science as right. opposed to <laughs> uh, an ideology right. and they come in and go like this is how nature works and the lawyers are there right. and they like i don't know any debt and i'm just going to assume are, yeah like a real thing um no it's it's very similar to that and uh, you know frankly it involved a lot of the same people the cato institute um, in the late nineties, um, was gung ho about, you know, how we had this puritanical, um, you know, uh, relationship, the, me you know, the medical, uh, community had this puritanical relationship with painkillers and really we needed to just like, you know, there was this epidemic of undertreated pain, all of the same guys who were, you know, telling you that antitrust was, um, obsolete and, and pointless. Um, a lot of them were also, um, you know, shilling uh, for Oxycontin um, and, you know, against climate change and all of that stuff. It's the same, the same old guys. And, you know, probably a lot of the same, the same tactics, you know, why need wine and dine these people who are lawyers and doctors who, you know, are, are affluent, but they, they're certainly not, you know, hedge fund manager rich. And you give these guys a little extra money to speak at your convention or mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to, you just give them a, a, a fancy golf weekend and, you know, it works very well. And the side of, of, you know, small business and workers um, and, and, you know, people who are just sort of antitrust geeks, <laughs> like, uh, like, you know, Lena Khan and, and I've gotten to be one to an extent. Um, uh, we obviously don't have the resources to do that. Um, but it's, um, uh, you know, so a lot of it is we're relying on um, judges sort of uh, realizing that this has happened. And as in medicine, a lot of doctors realized that they had been brainwashed, that they, you know, that they listened to that, that, that yeah, pharmaceutical companies are always trying to brainwash them. Um, it's a little harder in the cases with judges because they maybe have a, you know, high, higher opinion of their own um, uh, objectivity. My experiences with lawyers would indicate that that's the yeah. case. But uh, uh, that said, are there, do you, uh, being a, a self-professed uh, antitrust nerd, do you um, see any political constituencies that are growing, um, that, that are out there that are maybe just sort of like, you see, maybe starting to congeal? And what would those look like? And also, is there any effort within the context of the institution of law to sort of like push this, like I know that, you know, uh, the, we have the Federalist Society, which I'm sure has its own sort of like division of maintaining uh, the the purity of the Borkian view of antitrust. Is there anything on the sort of antitrust side that is attempting to sort of educate at the law school level? Yeah, well, I would say that there is a, they call it the, I think the Wall Street Journal has called it hipster antitrust. Um, I think that, um, uh, Lena Khan is basically considered the um, what what would you call her <laughs> like the Lana Del Rey of hipster and I trust um, <laughs> so kind, of avoid, kind of avoid making a Taylor Swift reference. Um, Thank you. It's very difficult. Like <laughs> she's she's like the Amazon of pop culture references. Um, but uh, but yes. So there is right i and i should say i'm in addition to the investigations editor of the american prospect i'm a fellow at the american economic liberties project which is a group that um was formed by um folks who uh you know initially they were at the new american foundation and then they sort of got silenced um by google which was a, a funder and they realized that they needed to stop taking money from google and um, and, and if they wanted to, you know, really achieve any of their policy goals. And so I think that this, there is a, certainly a concerted movement. Um, I meet law students all the time who are interested in antitrust. It's, it's, it definitely is, is sexy, um, in a certain realm of, um, of law student, um, in a way that 
like was un is unthinkable like uh, 10 years ago 10 uh, years I, ago i went to uh, law school uh for a year uh, i guess it was about 30 years ago and i don't think i ever heard anybody talk about antitrust i don't even think i heard their words antitrust uh, the entire time I was there, it just was not something that was discussed right. in the the nineties. It was just not an issue. No, it's, it was very, yeah, it's, it was extremely niche. And honestly, the only people, you know, it was like one of those things that had, by, by the time the nineties came around, it was like something that M and a lawyers cared about, right? Like it was something that they kind of gave them work to do, gave them billable hours. Um, cause there was, you know, there was always like a few divestments that they would have to do when they wanted to do a merger. Um, but it, uh, it's, I think that there's, you know, so there's a movement, but there's nothing like nobody, there isn't some giant like pool of money. Um, so that's, that's going to be, a, be the problem. But I think that it's, it's got a, you know, it's sort of like the PMC labor movement. I, I would say in terms of it's, it certainly feels like it's, ascendant um in a way that i would never have imagined 10 years ago like i like the same way that i would never imagine to, like i would never have imagined 10 years ago sort of like in the aftermath or like you know 12 years ago like kind of during um the like tea party backlash um to the obama administration that um and and scott walker's um union busting like that that we would have a a you know a whole bunch of strikes happening all the time. Um, but, and, and that there would be this, um, you know, militant labor movement that was, um, extremely popular. Um, I think that there is a similar trajectory, um, with antitrust, um, among, you know, kind of the, the types of people who go to law school. So that is the, th the one thing that gives me, um, hope, but, you know, again, like these, these companies have, a lot of money. The only thing that I, you know, and, and what I'll say is that they're legal, like when you le read their responses, when you read their lawsuits again, you know, that it, it, they're not impressive. Um, the, the, the ideology the you know, the theories that destroyed antitrust enforcement in this country were never impressive. They were always baby brain bullshit. Um, but you know, they had they had all the the money on their right. side so that uh, there's a lot of that i th i find uh on on a lot of uh, issues frankly uh motatic uh, investigations editor at the american prospect uh thanks so much for your time today uh great to talk to you always about this stuff and um as we get uh less redaction uh, hopefully we'll have you back and find out uh you know oh, yeah. <laughs> what project nessie is In the first response <laughs> Project Nessie sounds, awesome. it has to do with, I'm convinced, like something that's underwater, right? <laughs> like Loch Ness. Ooh. Right? Yes. yes. I, yeah. I think that that was one of the, you know, it's sort of like Enron, like nicknamed all of its um, off-balance sheet vehicles after Darth Vader and, you know, the Star Wars characters, Chewie and Raptor. Um I think that, yeah, I think that that is, and I think that's one of the reasons that the FTC <laughs> put it in the lawsuit because I think they couldn't resist. But um, yeah, there's a story in the Wall Street Journal about what exactly is Project Nessie today. I'm still not entirely, uh, I still don't understand it, but you know, um, there's a lot more to come in this one. So I would imagine if the Wall Street Journal is writing about it, it's almost, uh, it, it is almost specifically designed to take anyone's guesses uh, in a in the wrong direction. Is my exactly. is my guess, but um, uh, Motachik, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.